in 2014, our, we had some big issues on vegetable prices. And so one of our employees said, you know, let's just buy a truck and go buy the vegetables ourselves. And me and him, you know, we did the puja for the truck. We took it to a temple. And then, you know, me and him would go once, twice a week to the market and like in cash, we would buy all these vegetables. We were paying salaries in cash back then too. <laughs> Welcome to episode five, season one of Millionaire Mondays, the show where we bring you the stories of real Indian startups told by the entrepreneurs that built them. I'm Caleb Friesen, and on the show today, how an American entrepreneur started a company in India selling Mexican fast food called California Burrito. Today, California Burrito is a profitable business, generating upwards of 100 crore rupees in revenue every single year. But the interesting thing is that its founder, Burt Mueller, actually never planned on becoming an entrepreneur. Before coming to India, he was planning on becoming a movie soundtrack composer, having worked on a number of film scores since 2008. But during his stay in Jaipur in 2010, he discovered a business opportunity that he simply couldn't pass up. See, one of Burt's fellow students in the study abroad program was actually a big fan of Mexico food. And they would actually cook Mexican food for people in Jaipur, and this food got a tremendous response. Bert realized that Mexican flavors were very compatible with the Indian palate, and yet there were very few Mexican restaurants in the country. India had plenty of pizza, burgers, and fried chicken, but almost no burritos. And so he returned to the United States to start researching how he could build a business in India. When I came back, I felt my eyes had been opened. Oh, wow. You know, things were just, you, it's very different living here. And you see things that, then the U.S. looks very different to you. Um, so I, I think I just came to the conclusion as soon as I got back, I was probably running one day, you know, jogging, and just thought, you know, I think, you know, what would I do in the next 10 years of my life? And, you know, where would I learn the most? And I was like, I learned a lot in India. Maybe if I start a business in India, I'd, I'd probably learn even more. Wow. Of course, India is fast growing. The U.S. was in a recession at that time. So you think maybe, maybe also it could be a good, you know, financial idea. Interesting. Um, and then, you know, started thinking about business ideas, but always, I was in love with the kind of Mexican food and especially the format. Um, so Chipotle obviously is the gold standard in that. Um, and then Qdoba, Moe's, there's a few others as well. Um, you actually went and worked at Moe's, right? When you I came did. back to the US. So once I decided that I wanted to do this, I committed to it. I think it was probably in September of 2010. You know, just after the the new year was starting, I, d I just enrolled in a business school class and um, got a job at Moe's to see if I liked it or not. Uh, I'd worked in food service earlier, so I knew food, um, but then just took a kind of a part time job at Moe's, um, doing know, doing what frying chips, serving on the line. Okay, um, with a it, it's kind of also a very different socioeconomic class of people who were working there. So that was also a kind of an interest interesting experience. Yeah. Um, most of most college graduates don't uh, end up going and working. In, I think I was the only one <laughs> in QSR. Yeah, uh, but made friends with a few of them. You know, there were some people who'd been in prison. Uh, you know, it's not a not obviously the choice job for a lot of people, but good people working there. And, and uh, yeah, that that kind of got me hooked. I think just seeing customers interacting with customers, and I love the food in the format. So. Was it also while you were back there in the United States that you connected with your co-founders and pitched them this idea of maybe starting a company in India? Yeah. So I think once I got back, I started speaking with Galen about it, and he he was a fan of it as well, although he was at that time uh, acting. So he had an acting career, and he had just uh, he had shot some big movie called Band Slam, uh, I think a, a year or two earlier, and so he still had acting gigs he was getting. So he was, uh, you know, while interested in it, I think ultimately had other things he was doing. Um, so even when we started, he was not here for, I think, the first six or eight months. Oh, really? Uh, and then came after that. Okay. And then your other co-founder, he's, is he in Indo-American? He's not. His, his, he, uh, his name is Indian. His name is Dudham. His parents had converted to Sikhism in the 60s, um, but not Indian at all. Help me to understand you and your two co-founders are all coming from the United States for the first time. I guess you get your own respective apartments. You're figuring out life here when you start the company. 
How were you able to finance um, the business in the early days? Was it just money out of your own pockets? Some. So I, I, we originally each put in, I think, $15,000. Uh, and then our parents each probably put in fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Uh, and then what we did is when we came here, we started a Tumblr. So every every day or two, we would post whatever we were doing. And we had pitched some people before we came to India about this business. And people were, I think, uh, appropriately skeptical, uh, you know, 22 year olds in a country they don't know doing a business they don't know, you know, probably should be. But the, you know, I think the Tumblr uh, convinced people that we at least were doing the right approach, um, you know, developing tortillas, working on kitchen equipment, looking for real estate. And uh, I think that kind of convinced some people who were on the fence. So I think we raised about 200 and maybe $50,000 to do the first two stores. Um, which was more than enough for that. That was like a trip, uh, triple F round, family, friends. And, yeah, yeah. Okay, and fools. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but clearly not, because uh, the business actually ended they, up. They, they've done pretty well. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of just getting a restaurant up and running, um, you know, as you mentioned, kitchen equipment, uh, you have to think about staffing, who are these employees that we're going to be hiring in this location, um, figuring out the menu, the yeah. ingredients, supply chain. Like, how long did that take? And- what was the experience? You even said like one of your co-founders, Galen, didn't come for six months. So like, was it basically just you and your other co-founder on the ground? It was, yeah, it was me and Dudham and we had hired an ops person in the kind of an ops manager at that point in time. We did some catering uh, to get our feet wet. We catered for Zynga. We had made a friend with a guy at brunch who was the head of Zynga India. So we catered for them. We catered for, I think, uh, one of these German multinationals. And so that got, we hired a chef actually who came in from the US also from California. Um, so the, it was a lot of R and D happening, uh, but mainly I think what uh, kind of kept us a little slow. It took ten months to open, eleven months to get the first store opened. Was just real estate. You know, restaurants run on real estate in a, in a big sense. Yeah. So setting up that first location in Embassy Golf Links Tech Park. Um, that's a pretty desirable place to great property. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it must have been like you guys are brand new, right? Yeah. Uh, they've never heard of you. You, you, you know, I don't even know if you had a, you had a website at that point. Yeah, I'm guessing. I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> You've got a Tumblr. You've got a Tumblr. <laughs> hey guys, take, take yeah. a look at our Tumblr, right? Not that convincing. Yeah. Um, was it difficult to secure that first location and how did you go about it? We, you know, we paid it too high a rent. That's effectively what we did. But, um, yeah, we were looking at Orion mall, uh, where a deal fell through. We had, we had, we had gotten close to signing a deal, but they were skeptical. So did not sign that. Do you, are you happy that you didn't end up going that route and chose tech Honestly, parks? Honestly, uh, I think that would have also worked. Okay. Um, but the property we got was better. So I, both, I think, would have put us on a path of success, but the one we got was definitely better. Why didn't you look at Jaipur? Like you had experience there, you'd been there, um, you're familiar with the people there. Uh, why not start your first location there? I think... Um, you know, a couple of things. We actually came in March of 2011 to do an R and D trip, so we'd written a business plan, and you know, really Bangalore and Gurgaon looked like the two best places uh, for multiple reasons. So visited both of those. Bangalore was just the clear winner, which we thought. And then it, after we were here for two weeks in December, we were like, Bangalore is the place. But Taco Bell had opened in 2010. Uh, they opened in Bangalore. So also the presumption was that Yum had been in the market for a long time. They probably knew a bit about what to do. Um, so yeah, Bangalore was clearly the winner. You know, re real estate was cheaper. There were more tech parks here. So the, you know, better real estate from kind of a safety perspective, people who've traveled abroad. Got it. You were also, uh, if Taco Bell was already in the country, then you're kind of, uh, are you, you must be looking at how can we position ourselves in a way that is, we're able to compete with them, right? Especially as a small company without the kind of backing that they have as, as this massive global QSR. I think at that point in time, not much actually. Uh, I would say post 2019, yes. You know, then they were bigger, we were bigger. Then there's, the market was bigger as well. Back then, I think they had a very different property strategy than us. They were taking malls and standalones. We were doing tech parks. Um, so wasn't we were paying attention to what was working for them and what was not working for them, but we were not actively trying to maybe peel customers off from them. 
Got it. But that's helpful to be able to look at them and say like, oh yeah, that was a mistake that we can probably yes. avoid. Yeah. I remember they did some kind of Indian inspired campaigns. They did a Katito, which was a Kati burrito. They did some odd uh, things that clearly were not resonating with people. Um, went very heavy on mayo in the food. I probably shouldn't say negative things about Taco Bell, <laughs> right? Uh, but yeah, paid attention. I mean, and, and then I think they kind of course corrected in 2017 or no. I think they're doing they're doing a great job now. Yeah. I mean, I love their locations specifically, like the yeah, just the layout of the of the absolutely yeah. Um, okay, so then you know you're probably learning a little bit from them, but really this is sort of uh, no man's land, right? This is unknown territory for you guys. How do you go about bringing something to the Indian market that? people aren't really that familiar with burritos. Like, I don't think, I mean, I still hear people to this day, like one of the podcasts that you did in the past, like it's even the pronunciation, like burrito, yeah. right? And we we say burrito. Um, so how did you go about it? I mean, how did you make this first uh, push into the Indian market? Um, so I think our first location was just opposite Goldman Sachs head office. And they had lots of people who were well aware of the format. So they educated the people who worked there. So I think it was path of least resistance. We didn't want to to have to figure out how to market it. Right. Over time, I think it was, it was really word of mouth. We never did marketing. Mistake, we should have done marketing. Um, but word of mouth did enough. And so I think we really didn't start marketing until after COVID. Did you find that the reception when you opened your first uh, location was positive? Did people? It was insane, actually. Um, I mean, I was checking our numbers before I came here. We did fantastic numbers our first three months. Um, you know, I think even now we, we did like 150 bills in an hour there, which is like probably 200 people we served in an hour, which we've broken subsequently, but that wasn't broken for a long time, you know, after that. So there was, I, I mean, people were excited that, the, that we'd opened. Um, you know, we did our best as we could at that point in time in terms of supply chain. Um, and hopefully, you know, we keep getting better at it. But yeah, it, was, it honestly it did well from day one. Yeah, uh, I, I I was working on the serving line. I think Galen was working there. Um, yeah, very busy. You're working on the serving line. I think I worked on the serving line for about the first six months. Wow. So what was that like? I'm sure a lot of people were just like super confused. Like that's sort of a, a menial job, right? Yeah. Um, they're just seeing this foreigner doing this job. Um, that would have been more interesting than the food, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that was part of the marketing. You know, that that definitely piqued people's interest. But over time, I think you know, the food was was pretty good. We were pretty fast. Prices were good. Um, so it, it did it did well. Financially as well? Financially as well. Uh, second store did well. As we did a, I, I remember I'd met the head of Krispy Kreme Asia. The Krispy Kreme had just opened on Church Street. So I'd met the head of Krispy Kreme Asia and I took him to our store and he said, you know, just duplicate this or replicate this at least five or 10 times and then do a different type of property. <laughs> so we listened to him for the next store, but then ignored him for the third store. But then the fifth, sixth, seventh store, we <laughs> listened to him. All tech parks. Yeah, effectively. Okay. And um, all in in Bengaluru. Yeah. I, we, I mean, we did one standalone in Kormangala, which was a big investment, started badly. Um, that one eventually picked up, uh, but it took probably six months or five months to break even, hmm. which okay. is a new experience. We were generally used to making money in you know, a first month or second month. You were able to recoup your investment? No, 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 not recoup, but start turning cash. Got it. Um, which Kormangala was a, definitely a loss maker for at least six months. Okay. Um, but overall, it seems like those first five, six locations generally across the board, everything was going well. Your business was successful by all accounts. Mostly well. I think, you know, barring, yeah, mostly well. And what did people think back home? Uh, you're still updating the, the Tumblr at this point? I think, uh, so after we'd opened our third store, we thought let's raise more money and do more stores. Uh, so I think we went out and raised about $750,000. Yeah. Um, From an individual, right? An angel investor. Uh, Advit invested a good amount of that, maybe half of that. Okay. They did maybe half of that. The rest came from kind of the same people. And what did those funds enable you to do? That took us through to 2016. It probably took us to 15 uh, restaurants or yeah, maybe 15 or 16 restaurants. So basically investing mainly in expanding your your foot your footprint yes. across the city. Yeah. Okay. Not so much into the marketing as you said. No, nothing <laughs> in marketing unfortunately. 
That's really surprising. Do you, do you kind of regret going uh, looking back that you you didn't make a more 100%, significant push? Percent okay, mistake. Hmm. You know, we should have we should have been smarter about marketing. We should have been smarter about probably investing in the brand. Yeah, I think we 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 had worked with some agencies at the beginning, and we we're not happy with the the output. Maybe Bangalore wasn't that mature at that stage in marketing, um, but should have done that by 2015, 2016, people were doing some good stuff. Um, so yeah, I think that would have definitely propelled us in a better way. I think the first location that I saw was your location in Kormungla. Um, I'm not sure what road it's on, kind of nearby Black Pearl. Um, yeah. that, was, that was the location that you opened? That was the first one. And we wound up selling that, we, it was too big of a property. Yeah. Big rent, we sold it to Leon Grill, they moved in. Okay. And then we shifted right around the block. Right around the block. Okay, I think that's yeah, the one that I. Smaller I've... one now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's next it's to too a ca- small, but next to a cafe, I think. Yeah, a good grocery store. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I remember seeing that. I remember looking at the logo and California burrito. Like, what? This is kind of weird. Like, you know. And uh, eventually, I think I ended up ordering my first burrito bowl. Was like in yeah. Pranagar during some one of these podcasts that I was yeah, yeah, doing yeah. Uh, after the podcast. Me and the guest went. And yeah, it was a it was a positive experience. Um, and Good. I just remember like, how have I not heard about this company before? Like, the logo is sort of iconic, eye catching. The three stars. Um, was that you? Did you come up with the the I, branding I, and the I logo? May, yeah, I designed the logo. Okay, you know, maybe you should hire professionals. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it stood out to me. Yeah. Um, the name too was that you or you, you and your co founders kind of discussed that. I would say that that was me. Okay. Yeah, we we had discussed a lot of names, and then one day, I think. Yeah, it was just it was clear we tried showing these to people on the on the street the brand logos and it just seemed obvious that one the formats from California um you know to the chef we'd hired was from California uh and people like California. So it's, well, it's maybe it's a little basic but ultimately it's you know people don't know about it so Let's be a little obvious. Yeah. No, it's the most well-known, I think the most well-known American state. Probably, uh, yeah. Everybody over here, is, especially in Bengaluru, right? Yeah. California is kind of the number one place for startup founders to kind yeah. of relocate to if they're going to the U.S. Um, were there any other names that you guys played around with? A bunch. What were some of those? Won't say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we did logos. They were, you know, looking back, good. right, right decisions were made on that. Okay. So you raise this $750,000 in 2013. Yeah. Um, really exciting, right? Uh, probably a little bit of stress as well, pressure, like, okay, now we really have to go after this. Yeah. Um, and the way that you guys were expanding is kind of interesting. And, and I would say maybe it's typical in India, I'm not sure, but definitely in the United States, going the company-owned location route mm-hmm. is less common than taking the franchising approach. Yeah. Why did you guys decide to... Do, do it that way instead of going with the franchising approach. So we did two franchises back then and- Oh, like, one of the first like five or six locations? Yeah, so our fourth location was a franchise. Oh. They invested, we ran the show. Um, I think there was apprehension from my side on control. Maybe once you reach a scale, you have the system or you have the, you know- The SOP. Kind of, yeah, you have the infrastructure to support and you know, support a franchise, um, which, and also I had not seen anyone do that successfully. You know, Subway had done it, and I think to their detriment, which they're now reversing. You know, generally a franchise, a franchise business, um, it you need a mechanism to enforce, and India is not famous for its robust and quick legal system, uh, which to me would be necessary to do a good franchising operation. Would you say that that's one of the reasons why franchising in the United States has been more successful? Because you, you can sue people like Absolutely. super easily? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, you Whereas know, here, I think consequences. it's- Consequences. Here- It's more about muscle. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I just- uh, You have to know people. Different strategy. Yes. <laughs> so. very, very diplomatic of you. Um, but that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I, I, I think now, actually, I see a few people franchising, and it might go well. I remember Caventers had done a, a big franchise expansion. It was kind of a disaster. Um, and I remember meeting someone from their senior team, and he said his whole job was getting rid of franchisees, uh, you know, basically consolidating because it was too tough. People would change the milk, what, you know, not fun to. No, I, I heard about that actually. Yeah. It was, uh, 
quality control is a cha- well, is a challenge problem. Especially, you know, it might be easier for us because we have uh, control on certain ingredients. But even then, I just wouldn't do it now. You know, if if we can generate enough cash to open stores pretty quickly, first off, why bother? But then, do you really want? If you're not going to let a franchisee run the store, which Subway does, you know, they they let their franchisees run the stores. I wouldn't do that. Um, you know, then why bother having 50 investors when you just have like two? Because uh, if if a franchisee goes wrong, also, you know, that might be a lot of money for them. Yeah. So who wants to be in trouble for that? Totally. But I think the the flip side here is that as you're expanding in this company owned format, uh, it's very easy to kind of spread yourself too thin, right? Because mm-hmm. you have to have sort of oversight over all of these different locations. Um, has that been a challenge? And especially in the early days while you were expanding, was it was it stressful? Did you did you feel anxious about sort of continuing to expand with this company owned approach? Uh, not really. I think we never really gave a lot of thought to franchising. We thought about it and then thought that's a bad idea. Um, probably our investor wanted us to do that because, you know, cash, um, less dilution. But I, 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 there, I, I think expanding every time you double your size, things have to change kind of from a, a, an operation and management perspective. So uh, Mas Kalander had expanded a lot back then. So I got some advice from Gaurav, who was running Mas Kalander. Um, and I think he gave me some good food for thought on that. So probably we had a little bit of a rough patch in management, I would say maybe 2014, 2015, where we could have done a better job. Uh, and that's where we had, we had opened quite a few stores in those, in that period of time. Um, but things did settle down. And I think now we have a much better handle on what infrastructure is required to do the next doubling of, you know, store count. Yeah. And you said too there that, uh, 2014, 2015 was a bit of a challenging time period. Yeah. How much of that had to do with um, your co-founder kind of going back? Galen uh, had got a, a gig, I guess, a TV show or a movie and had to move back to the United States. Um, did that make things more difficult for you and uh, Dudham? I don't think, not really. It was just the store counts had increased. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, Galen got married, so he went back and got married um, and had other things he wanted to do. So uh, I think India never suited him very well especially from a food perspective. Couldn't couldn't <laughs> so, handle the hot food. Not a spicy guy. <laughs> That's so funny. Do you have spicy food at, at California Burrito? Actually, our new salsa that we just made is much spicier. So I, I like spice. Every time I meet people in, in QSR, I always tell them, like, you need to up the spice here. Yeah. Like, it needs to be so hot that, like, there's an option for Indians who think that they're tough, but then they find out that they're not. <laughs> Absolutely. The An- Andra style. <laughs> yes, exactly. So tell me about that time period, 2014, 2015. You went from, what was it, six? We probably went to about six to 12 stores. Yeah. So as you said, like that doubling. Yes. What were the lessons that you learned during that time period about expansion? I think probably should have hired some more senior people uh, in certain positions. Um, I think also we had diversified the type of stores and maybe gotten a few properties that were too small. Um I think just teething and not having enough bandwidth. Nothing uh, sort of nearly fatal, though. It was no, just, not fatal. Just small challenges along the way. I think, you know, yeah, small challenges along the way. I mean, sales, it wasn't like sales were going down. They were going up, but probably they could have gone up a lot more if we'd done a better job. Yeah. Um, so just help me to understand at this point in the journey, what is, what is like, how does, what does the business look like? Um, you open a location, that's an initial investment, Mm -hmm. right? Um, you set up all the sort of location infrastructure, the people, uh, the inventory, the kitchen stuff that's expensive. Um, you know, and then you're selling these, these burritos, which are, you know, they're, they're just a small little piece of food, right? Uh, this is how it is in QSR, like the margins are kind of thin. So just help me to understand financially, how is the business functioning on a location by location basis? You know, I remember in 2014, our, we had some big issues on vegetable prices. And so one of our employees said, you know, let's just buy a truck and go buy the vegetables ourselves. Uh, so we did that. And me and him, you know, we did the puja for the truck. We took it to a temple. And then, you know, me and him would go once, twice a week to the market and like in cash, we would buy all these vegetables. We were paying salaries in cash back then too. <laughs> 
Um, but you know, things got more professionalized. Um, but I think that that experience of, you know, taking it upon ourselves to go out and do procurement made us think about a lot of the prices we were paying for things. Um, and I think that almost it, it brought this ethos into the company that, you know, if, if, it, if, if we're not able to get what we want at the price we want, maybe we just do it ourselves. So, you know, one of the things in the future that we were thinking about was avocados, because, you know, I keep going back to Mexico and you have the food there. You go, wow, this is really good. You know, Mexicans are amazing at Mexican food. Go figure. Who would have thought? Yeah. Um, and then you go, wow, it's not quite as good here. So what do you, you know, what's missing? And, and it always came back to ingredients. So I think the first thing we did was we, you know, we had gone to some banana growers association, which was uh, uh, run by the coffee guys uh, for uh, reasons uh, unknown. I guess they have different crops. Is this what, like Korg, Uti? This is in Dindigal. Dindigal, okay. Yeah. Uh, so in sorry, where is that? That's in Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu. Okay. Yeah. So Dindigal Talapakati is from the restaurant chain. Dindigal Talapakati is from Dindigal. So oh, okay. I've been to their original restaurant a few times. So they're um, growing coffee. They're also growing bananas. And and then they're trying to promote other, not cash crops, but hopefully profitable things to create shade or whatever. So uh, avocados were getting promoted. So we had gone there to see if anyone was actually interested in growing avocados for us. And specifically Haas avocados, right? Specifically Haas. Uh, so then we wound up you know, meeting a few contacts there and started pursuing importing these trees from the US. Um, so we- That must've been a challenge. Yeah, big challenge. Not easy getting trees inside <laughs> India. <laughs> yeah. Did you have to get some some kind of permits to like, or like approval even that, hey, is this like, is this crop going to be invasive or like? Yeah. Those are the concerns people have. Yeah. Yeah. Complicated. Um, but yeah, we got, it took about eight months and then the trees came in and then we got them planted. Actually, wound up working with Namdaris on that, um, the supermarket chain. They're, nice. They actually have a huge agriculture business. They don't have, they don't carry guacamole, do they? They do have avocados. They do? Yeah, it might okay. be some from our trees. <laughs> haven't, I, I haven't seen it, but I'll keep my eyes open. Um, uh, so we partnered with them on that. And um, yeah, the trees are fruiting beautifully. I just got pictures the other day. Wow. So I think this is like the first year we got fruits from the trees. Oh, congratulations. Like four years. That's, incre that's a long uh, time span. But yeah, trees take a long time to grow. They do. Uh, and then we've started growing other ingredients now from a like tomatillos we're doing, which is in the salsa, and beans we're launching in September that we've grown, um, blackened pinto beans, and then chilies we're doing, uh, working on romaine now. Is that part of the pl the long-term plan is to have like California burrito be self-sufficient in terms of the ingredients that it uses in its food? I think key ones where either the market doesn't have the ingredient or we don't like the quality. I, tomatoes, Tomatoes taste different in Mexico than they do in India, as do onions. Yeah. yeah. I think Mexicans invented tomatoes, basically. So Mexicans have this incredible culture of horticulture, you know, corn and tomatoes. and But those are not ones where you can't get a decent option. But you can't buy tomatillos and could not buy Haas avocados. Now you can't. Or imported ones you can get, but you can't get local ones. And the prices are crazy. Um so I think it, the view is that if it makes a difference in the taste and it makes it kind of more real in terms of Mexican, then we do it. Romaine is just, I'm not happy with romaine quality. So now we're working on that as a, where do you get good romaine? The other thing that I've, that I've found is that there's not a lot of good nachos in this country. Chips. Yeah. Like yeah. Corn definitely is. Tortilla a, chips. Corn could be a good project. Yeah, so it's I'm, it's always disappointing. I always order nachos at like pretty much every restaurant that I go. Just yeah. to hope I'm like crossing my fingers, like <laughs> hopefully this time it's good. No, it's Doritos. Yeah, that they all do that. It's so disappointing. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I need like Kipasa to be here. Yeah, that uh, Kirkland brand. Well, you know, Taco Bell was importing from China in the beginning. Oh, wow. It's insanely expensive. We also looked at it. It was insane from Mission. Mission is a big producer of that but just insanely expensive. Hmm. So this seems to be a theme though, running through the story, which is um, the value and importance of control in yeah. QSR, that instead of going the franchising route, you took the company owned approach because you want to be in control of these locations. You want to be able to ensure quality um, and you want to have oversight over every aspect of the business. But 
again, as you're going from five to 12 to, you know, on and on and on before the pandemic, I think what, how many locations did you guys have? We had 37 stores before the pandemic. Yeah. 37 stores. That's, and, and, uh, that's, that's a huge number, right? Yeah. Um, managing all of those locations, having oversight would have been, I would imagine it would have been challenging, right? I think that, you know, in a way, two things helped us. Number one, we have a great team and we have a lot of people who've been in the system for a long time. Number two, the Swiggy and Zomato have, while delivery is obviously an important channel and they take a lot of margin, they also provide a lot of data. And I think that data has helped us run our operations better. A um, lot of things can be done with the ratings, the prep time, looking at an hour a day, you know, product. So I think that um, kind of getting a, a holistic view from the data has helped us control things. That's really interesting that you're you're sort of using Swiggy and, and Zomato to collect data during that. Was it like basically 2014, 2018, 2019? That's a big part of how you're able to like have. I would say from 2019. 2019 yeah. is when you started to really then we were that. really using that. Interesting. Yeah. What about um, like offline? Like people come into the restaurant and they just want to order something in person. Yeah. Was there was there a data gap there? I think that uh, the data that we get in delivery kind of correlates with dine-in. Got it. So if a store is doing badly on those metrics, they're not usually doing well on dine-in metrics. Dine-in, there's less data. Uh, so you get ratings from Google and Zomato or whatever. Um, we have our own feedback system as well. But you don't get kind of as rich a view. Um, that's what I would say. And a lot of restaurants are in the same position. Collecting rich data from dine-in customers can be a real challenge. And for a lot of restaurants, they use in-house solutions, which might work in the early days with a single location restaurant. But when you're running a multi-city chain of restaurants like Burt, you're gonna wanna have a bulletproof way of collecting and making use of data, which is where this video sponsor, Explorex, comes into the picture. Their flagship platform, Bridge, is an operating system for your entire restaurant business. It doesn't matter how many locations you have, Bridge makes it easy for you to manage it all. The data that Bridge provides you with will enable you to make informed decisions on the direction in which your restaurant business needs to grow. And by the way, this is literally all happening from your smartphone. Explorex has a proven track record, having worked with more than a thousand restaurants across 15 cities in India, which is why they're so confident in their ability to improve your bottom line efficiency and also increase your restaurant's productivity and revenue. To learn more about Explorex and their operating system for restaurants, click on the link in the description down below. And now let's get back to the podcast. So 2014 until the financial year of 2018 was a pretty exciting time for you guys. You had a couple of uh, bumps along the way, but really it was a it was a growth story for you guys up until essentially the pandemic, yeah. right? You were able to go from seven crore rupees to 21 crore rupees in revenue. Um, and then you also were actually a loss-making company back in 2014, but by the end of the financial year of 2018, you had a you were seeing a profit of... I think it was like 96 lakh rupees, about roughly. About a crore, yeah. Yeah, about a crore in, in profit, yeah. uh, which is pretty incredible. Um, you, it's you and your your one co-founder now. Um, and then the pandemic hits, um, which obviously for restaurants across the country and across the world was a very challenging time. Uh, I think at that point you had like quite a bit of, uh, your business was coming from deliveries though. You, you were mentioning Swiggy and Zomato. So um, was that enough to kind of keep things afloat or did you really still see like a pretty big uh, sort of uh, dip in your revenue and, and struggling to kind of keep things afloat? So I think that, you know, Feb 2020 was our best month ever. Oh. So we just crossed like four crore. So, you know, wow. I had gone to Korea actually in the end of Jan and coronavirus. I think we were in a hotel that had had coronavirus cases like the first in Korea. So I started getting the sense things could go very bad. Uh, clearly, you know, people in Korea were scared of this. Uh, and then came back to India. Obviously, then in March, I think end of March, things really went south. So overnight, we went from, you know, four plus crore a month to 25 lakhs um, because you know, delivery was probably 30% of our business at that point in time. Uh, but most of our stores were in, t half of our stores were in tech parks, which immediately were dead. Oh, right. So And malls as well. Yeah, malls and tech parks were immediately dead. Uh, so all we had left were like the standalone stores. And I think, you know, the first two months we were kind of scratching our heads. What on earth are we going to do here? 
Uh, but then we figured a few things out and started spending on marketing and gradually, you know, sales came back. Did you have money in the bank uh, at around the time that the pandemic hit? We had just, you know, I think IJR Investor had just invested a crore right before. Um, we had a little, yeah, we had probably two crore, one and a half crore. We probably had one and a half crore in the bank, um, which then we checked our notes and I was like, that'll last us <laughs> not that long. <laughs> um, so, you know, cash is king, right? So we raised a little money from our existing investors in May 2020 um, and then just really buttoned down. Was that a hard thing to do, raising raising those funds? Because I think a lot of people were extremely bearish on your industry. I think uh, people understood that not only there was a, a unique growth opportunity, probably the valuation was compelling and things would not always be bad. Um, of course, they were taking a bet we would survive, but we had survived for you know eight years in, in India already, so probably could figure this one out. Yeah. Well, you sound like you were optimistic, and you know I think you've always had that can-do attitude, right? Any challenges? Yeah. Overcome. Nothing, nothing is. Yeah. Anything's possible. Yeah. But your your co-founder, I think he. I'm not sure if he had this. That was planned. So he left in May 2020. That was okay. that was pre-planned. He even before the pandemic. It he, was planned before the pandemic. We were kind of going to change the trajectory of the company. He had other things he wanted to do. We were yeah. we were actually planning to raise money. So I, I I think that wasn't a that wasn't a pandemic related. Understood. And he went to the United States, and now he's running his own. Yeah, he did, startup. He, he went to business school and uh, Kellogg, and now he's done. You know, he's doing his own startup. Nice. Um, so then you become. A solopreneur in in May of 2020. Yeah. Um. After starting with two other people. Yeah. Um. And you're like you're an American in this foreign country. Um. Like, was it? I mean, I can't imagine that it was like. Were you okay just doing it on your own, or was it sort of like did it become more lonely, or you have people around you like in the business that are? I think it makes running the business actually easier. I think that you probably, yeah, you, you lose a, fr I mean, if the friendship is very important. So not having a friend around is, is you miss that. But fundamentally running a business is easier. Um, it's not that it's so hard, but. No, it's like every big decision. Yeah, that, you have that, to be like, hey, what do you yeah, think Now I just, it? it's, I just decided. <laughs> so. And you've been doing this long enough now that y your intuition is probably. Yeah, I, my, my, my hunches are not terrible. Yeah. So. Whereas when you started, it yeah. might have been like, I don't really know what I'm doing. This exactly. is a new market for me. Probably, probably 2018, start making good decisions. Yeah. Um, so in a way, that, that was easier. And we have a fantastic team. I couldn't do it without people who are great working with me. Definitely. Um. So I think, you know, we all have a shared vision. We have kind of a shared work ethic, uh, and that drives things. Yeah, you were mentioning earlier, too, that um, it seems like your people stick with you. Like, your attrition is probably on the lower side. Um, I feel like definitely at the corporate level it is. Yeah. Um, at the store level, it's probably lower than the market. But I wouldn't say it's, uh, uh, you know, it generally QSR has high attrition. Sure. Yeah. So it's not, you know, comparing to other industries, it'd be high. But for us, it, I think it's pretty decent. At what point uh, did you feel like you had, your business had kind of recovered or you were in the clear post the pandemic? Was that like sometime in 2021 after the second wave? Yeah, I think it was probably 2021, maybe the second half of 2021. I think we had started making money again. And then I think by October or November, we had gotten back to sales numbers from pre-pandemic with much fewer stores. Oh, um, so stores still hadn't come back, but sale had come back. Right. Um, so I think that's when we felt, you know, we're on a good path now. Yeah. So did you, I mean, things were working, as you said, like um, the month before the pandemic hit India, you were doing better than you ever had been. Yeah. Um, four crore in, in, in a month. Um, did you just pick up where you left off in terms of business strategy or did the pandemic sort of open up this new um, opportunity to maybe change strategy? I think it just uh, made us think much more sharply about what we wanted to do. So I think, you know, one piece was the, you know, Mexican ingredient journey, which was never deviated on that. I think one thing that changed in the pandemic was, uh, you know, where do stores go? Where do you put them? And earlier we would just say, okay, a tech park's there, let's open. And now we said, well, Actually, we won't open unless there's eight kilometers between the stores, so they have a good delivery radius. 
because the stores that, you know, one thing we noticed is that when we lost half of our stores, the stores that then started doing huge sales were just, there's a virtuous cycle because the food was better, the staff were better. There's a, a very virtuous cycle to doing more sales per store. <laughs> so then the view is, you know, why would you even want to operate a store that does 12 lakhs? Like, maybe which was our average pre-pandemic the store should do 30 lakhs um or more and, and then the store really is, is better as a as a unit and so i think property strategy changed a lot um i think also we realized that if we wanted to get dine-in back we needed more than kind of working professionals and we noticed taco bell was selling a lot of tacos we said we're not selling any tacos uh so we focused on taco as a product category Nice. So Let them educate the market, and then uh, they did a great job educating and re <laughs> reap the benefits. <laughs> uh, so that you know, we worked on Taco really for uh, two years, and probably I don't know, ten x our sales of tacos. Um, I think that was different product on delivery. We you know we started spending money on marketing. We did start using discount as a lever, uh, not too heavy, but there. Um, and I think, you know, those things combined, there was kind of compounding that happened and that was a very positive for the unit economics of the stores. Um, delivery is now about 60% of our business, you know, mm -hmm. so dramatic shift in kind of the model. Oh yeah, definitely. And it seems like at a certain point you realized, you know, we're, we're stronger than ever here. Maybe it's time to expand outside of Bengaluru, right? So we had opened an NCR in 2018. Okay. Uh, then we had opened in Hyderabad in 2019. So we were already in two other cities. Delhi had been okay. It did not go kind of as dreamed to start with. Hyderabad was way outside expectations, really good. Um, and then, But in the pandemic, I think we cracked both, you know, we cracked Delhi. Um, you know, people actually were ordering too many tacos in Delhi, I think because of Taco Bell. <laughs> so then we had to kind of educate about rice and push rice bowls. What is it about Hyderabad that made it such a good market for you guys? I think people from Hyderabad have traveled to the U.S. a lot. Oh, so yeah. they really know the cuisine. They know the format. I think Delhi less. They Maybe they've been to Europe, but they haven't really been to the U.S. as much. And maybe rice culture in Hyderabad too. Biryani. Yeah, but you know what? There's a rice culture. People like rice bowls everywhere. It's not... Um, it's not because earlier people said that, oh, you know, the South, everyone likes rice, but the North, everyone eats roti. But at the end of the day, people like a good meal and it can be rice too. And you guys are doing both, right? I mean, yeah, tortilla is kind of roti in a way, yeah. like it's <laughs> a flatbread. Um, but then you expanded to a new city, which was Chennai. This is pretty recent. Yeah. Um, so we just opened in Chennai. And it was like, I think it was the most successful location launch you've ever it was. How did you how did you make that happen? Was it just that people in Chennai were like aware of California burrito waiting for it to enter their market or did you t was it something that you guys did? I think it was maybe both. There were people definitely who knew us already there. Uh the other thing is we did a, we did a reel with me inviting people to the store in Tamil. Uh so people like You spoke that. Tamil? I spoke Tamil in the video. Um Do you remember any of the the script? <laughs> yeah. I speak a little Tamil. We have the Tamil employees were teaching me. Okay. About that. Um, Tell me something in Tamil. Vanakam uh, <laughs> Nanbargale. That sounds, uh, it has that like that sing song kind of tone, right? Yeah. I love I love the sound of Tamil. I, lo I love Tamil as well. So I, I've always had like this connection, I feel, <laughs> with that. So somewhere that materialized, the store did fantastic. Um, the reel blew up. Yeah, the reel did really well, uh, which surpri surprisingly, I think it's kind of different different experience. Yeah. Yeah. You you sort of uh sat in my seat for a little bit. Yeah. Being the for, the foreign guy making content for Indians. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and then in 2022 you guys did 110 crore rupees uh -huh. uh, in revenue. Uh was that your best year so far? It was best. Uh now this year will be much better. Okay, so now you have this pan India presence. Um do you think at any point you'll go outside of India? I I'm always encouraging Fa you know, Indian founders, you're not Indian, but um, just Indian startups in general to think about expanding globally so that India has more brands outside of the country that people can sort of, you know, Indians who are traveling outside yeah. feel like proud that, hey, this is like an Indian company too. Yeah. Uh, my view is probably not. 
I think that one, India is an incredibly huge market, a great market. Uh, I think two, the lessons that you learn doing business here may or may not be applicable to the other markets. Um, and then I think also, you know, all the work we're doing on ingredients is very much for India. So for me, you know, if Domino's can open up, you know, 13, 1500 stores in India, maybe we can also be a large option uh, for people here. Yeah. But not that we, that that's not our end goal. I mean, ultimately we just live to serve great food every day, uh, but maybe one day it becomes larger. So no, so there's probably not in the near term a future where you can find a California burrito in California. I think that, that probably very bad idea. <laughs> I think so too. There's probably enough burritos over there. Yeah, I think that's pretty competitive. Yeah. Um, so in terms of your future plans, right? You're yeah. now, like I said, solopreneur. Um, are you still like you just live in the California burrito life? Like you're you're enjoying it. You want to keep going, or is there a plan at some point in the future to maybe sell the company, um, an acquisition maybe, or like an IPO? I think there's no plan in that sense. Um, you know, we we have a plan to hopefully get to about 100 stores by March 2025. And maybe we'll take stock at that point of, of what happens next. Um, I, th there's, I think the beautiful thing is that, you know, things keep changing here. It's very dynamic. So, you know, every day I can see small improvements happening in our business and kind of just generally. So I'm very optimistic about, you know, where we'll be two years from now. Um, you know, we flirted in the past with acquisition, um, but I think never really, f I, I, at least personally, I always felt that we were giving up too much. Like there's, there's a genuine growth story here. Especially here in Bengaluru, right? The Silicon Valley of India, there's a lot of startups that, um, at least up until very recently, were high burn. Right? Yeah. That was part of the culture here was just raise a bunch of money from investors, um, throw it into marketing, basically grow as fast as possible, but not really in a sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And you guys have also raised money from investors, um, but I think you've, you've taken a very different approach where yeah. today in 2023, your business is profitable, right? Um, and that's been something that's sort of been with the business. Um, I'm not sure if, I guess, yeah, 20... Around 20, was it 2018, 2017? Um, or was it even earlier that you guys sort of became profitable? Most years we generated cash from the business. Yeah. Um, I think only COVID and maybe one year in the early years, you know, genuinely there was no, there was a negative. Yeah. Um, so you guys have chosen not to sort of grow beyond your means, right? You always generate a profit first, grow the business sustainably, and then uh, expand when it seems appropriate to do so. Yeah, I would say that's the case. I don't feel that there's some huge land grab that has to occur where I need to go out and open 500 stores tomorrow. You know, only really malls is the place where it's tough. When someone else is in, then it's tough to get in, um, which is Taco Bell strategy, it looks like. Um, but I think maybe it's a contrarian approach. Maybe it's a conservative approach. We've just always felt that you know stores should generate a lot of money. And until they do, then don't go wild opening them. Um, you know, now we're at a very healthy place. So I would get more aggressive now. Um, you know, if we could open, you know, three, four stores a month from cash flow, that would be, you know, great. Yeah. With the next milestone being what, a hundred stores probably? Yeah. I mean, we have, we had raised some money to, to do that. Although now, I mean, I don't foresee us kind of needing to do that again. I mean, unless we want to go and open, you know, 10 stores a month, then. <laughs> We don't generate enough cash to do that. And I don't see that happening you know, for a few years. But um, yeah, I think that that's always been our DNA is make sure that you know things make money. Um, food is not a new business. There's no you know spin on tech or whatever that even would be you know entertain. I don't think should be entertained <laughs> on uh, you know people pitching our type of business. Because uh, it's it's kind of straightforward. So make burritos, make people happy. Yeah, right. That's that's the basics. That was Bert Mueller, founder of California Burrito. And by the way, even though Bert today is a very successful solopreneur, there was a point in time when his daily driver was a Maruti Omni. Why did you used to drive an omnibus? So we had, I mean, we originally got that for transport in 2012 when we opened our first store and used it for catering. And they just always kept it. 
Um, and was that like your your daily driver? Like that's how you would get around. That's how I would get around. When I first came to India in Bangalore, especially, I was shocked at uh, how I, I saw this guy Ambarish, the actor. Uh, he's kind of the Clint Eastwood of Karnataka cinema, and he had just had his 60th birthday, and I was very impressed by his fan following. And I liked, I saw one of his movies. I checked out. I said, I like this guy. So then I, I had gotten his address from an auto driver and went to his house in uh, JP Nugger. Um, but anyways, kind of met him, took a photo with him and just kind of liked him. So then I started putting his face on the car, which then also kind of was a fun thing. You know, pe people put the stickers on the vehicles. Um, so he was kind of my kind of patron saint of the, you know, driving in Bangalore. You know, one funny thing that happened was, um, uh, Hari Bartia, the head of Jubilant, had come down to meet us. We, you know, we were discussing uh, certain things. And his car, he had a car, his car got a flat tire. So then I drove him around in my Maruti Omni. So he, you know, he's a billionaire guy. Uh, but that was fun. So I think that, you know, that car saw many different moments of vegetables and billionaires. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for watching or listening to the podcast this week, and I'll catch you in the next one. 